this lecture we're going to talk about the reactions of carboxylic acids. And the first reaction we're going to take a look at is Fischer esterification. Fischer esterification is when you take a carboxylic acid and you react it with an alcohol in the presence of an acid. And this makes esters. And the general reaction is uh, shown right here where you can see a generic carboxylic acid reacting with any type of alcohol in the presence of an acid to produce an ester and water as a byproduct. Now we're going to see this as an equilibrium process and so, and so um, depending on the reaction conditions you can actually reverse the reaction. Uh, these are typically um, done with an excess of one of the reactants. So for example, uh, we could use the alcohol as a solvent. So there would be a, a huge presence of the alcohol present. And you essentially shift the equilibrium uh, to the right to form our product. Now, uh, the reverse can also happen. So if I add water to an ester, you can get um, you can get the, the hydrolysis of that ester to form a carboxylic acid. So keep that in mind and you should be able to go through the mechanism of, of both of those um, scenarios. All right, so uh, the, the key is that Fischer esterification produces esters. We can make esters from carboxylic acids. And if we take a look at the mechanism of this process, we see that uh, in the first step, uh, in acidic conditions, we generate um, our alkyl oxonium ion, and that alkyl oxonium ion is going to protonate the um, carbonyl oxygen. Now, uh, if you look at a carboxylic acid, you might be saying to yourself, well, there are two oxygens, and so we see that... Um, you know, either one of those ox oxygens can be protonated, but of course, you know, we've talked about the acidity and basicity of um, of carboxylic acids, and we see that um, that the o oxygen of the OH is not very basic relative to the carbonyl oxygen, and one reason for this has to do with resonance again. So uh, we're going to protonate that carbonyl oxygen, and we're generating this um, positively charged species here, which we can uh, show um, is stabilized through resonance. So we can take a pair of pi electrons from that carbonyl and place them up onto the oxygen. We generate a carbocation species, which again can be stabilized by the other OH now. And you see that um, we, we now generate the, the, um, the resonance structure on the right is actually the same energy as the resonance structure on the left, and so we have uh, really two main resonance contributors here, which again um, explains the basicity of that carbonyl oxygen. All right, so let's take a look at uh, that protonated uh, carboxylic acid. Uh, once it's protonated, we know that the, um, the carbonyl carbon, the electrophilicity of it increases, and so it can react with a nucleophile. In, the, in this case, the nucleophile is the alcohol. So the alcohol uh, nucleophilically attacks. So we're adding to the carbonyl carbon, displacing a carbon-oxygen pi bond. And we generate uh, this species where now the, the uh, alcohol is forming an alkyl oxonium ion. The next step is deprotonation of that alkyl oxonium ion. And so what we have here is a neutral species, and we regenerate our, um, our acid, right? So I'll always think about acid catalyst. We're using an acid, generating the conjugate base, taking that conjugate base, and um, then reforming the conjugate acid. Now, this neutral species is called the tetrahedral intermediate. Um, and that tetrahedral intermediate, depending on its stability, may, um, may be uh, isolatable or, uh, or it can undergo further reaction. And in this case, in acidic conditions, um, it's going to undergo further reaction, just like we saw with the hemiacetals. So just like uh, hemiacetals, we can get um, 
uh, a number of things happening in this process, right? And in essence, there are two paths that, that you can think about this reaction mechanism undergoing. Uh, one is protonation of the OR and then it coming off and you would essentially go back to the carboxylic acid, but one is protonation of one of the OH groups. And in that case, we generate an ester. So let's see how that plays out. Here we have, we're going to protonate one of the OH groups. It doesn't matter which one it is. And there is my um, acid present, right? The alkyl oxonium ion is my acid that I'm going to be using. So I protonate the OH group. And now I have uh, formed something that has a good leaving group, right? So now water uh, can leave and I form uh, the carbocation now, and that carbocation can be stabilized. Now, it can be stabilized by the oxygen of the OR, it can be stabilized by the oxygen of the OH. Um, and of course, both of those uh, are resonance contributors. However, when we use the, ox the um, pair of electrons from the oxygen of the OH, notice what happens. We generate another carbonyl-like species that's protonated. Right, And so the last step is taking that protonated carbonyl and deprotonating it with an alcohol. So I can deprotonate it and I generate my ester. Again, notice I have regenerated my acid along in the process. So a couple of things to keep in mind. One thing that's certainly important is that each step in this mechanism is reversible. So uh, you need to be able to go from um, the ester to a carboxylic acid. Try to think if you can actually do that. You should be able to do that by now. Um, and so what we have here, and I mentioned this before I started talking about the mechanism, is that um, in order to, to produce ester, you usually have an excess of alcohol. And that excess of alcohol shifts the equilibrium based, based on Le Chatelier's principle toward ester formation. But if I have excess of water present, then I can hydrolyze the ester, uh, which leads to the formation of carboxylic acid. So you need to know this mechanism backwards and forwards literally. Now, one cool little feature about um, esters is that we can actually produce cyclic esters, and these are called lactones. And they're typically produced by an intramolecular fissure ester esterification of an alcohol with a carboxylic acid. So if you have a structure um, of uh, something that has both a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, and you see as the reagent, reagent <coughs> a catalytic amount of an acid, for example, sulfuric acid, um, then you should really be thinking about um, intramolecular fissure esterification. So the product that leads, uh, that, that we get here is, again, you see an ester, and it's a cyclic ester. So we call these lactones, lactones. And lactones are categorized by the ring size. Uh, the way that you categorize it is you label the um, carbons from coming off of the carboxylic acid. So the carbon attached to a carboxylic acid is called the alpha carbon, and then a beta carbon, and then a gamma, and then a delta. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, and if we locate those carbons on the ring, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, we see that on that delta carbon was the OH, and that's the one that generated the ester. And so we see, we call these delta lactones. Um, so six member cyclic esters are called delta lactones. Um, five member are called gamma lactones. Actually, four member are very popular in nature. They're, they are called beta lactones, and you'll, um, you'll hear beta lactones uh, often used. All right, so uh, esters can also be produced uh, fairly easily by reacting a carboxylate with 
uh, a primary alkyl halide or a methyl halide. Now we saw this reaction in the very first semester. Uh, it was essentially a nucleophilic substitution reaction where we take a carboxylate and we react it with um, a primary alkyl halide. Uh, generally speaking, secondary alkyl halides uh, lend to, um, lend to uh, uh, formation of alkenes, um, but we can use them uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, and this is an SN2 type mechanism, so the carboxylate attacks the um, alkyl group, displacing the halogen, and we form esters. Uh, notice a halide is also produced in the process. So this is just a little review of, of uh, a reaction that we've already seen. So here I have um, sodium butanoate and I'm reacting it with uh, methyl iodide in DMSO and I get the methyl ester, uh, methyl but butanoate. All right, so methyl esters can also be produced using a, a slightly different reaction, um, and we use diazomethane in the process. Now, diazomethane looks like this. It's CH2N2, CH2N2. And what happens is, if I take a carboxylic acid and react it with diazomethane, Diazomethane is a base, so this, the Lewis structure looks uh, like this, where you have uh, a carbanion uh, connected, so, uh, so methyl carbanion connected to a nitrogen that has a positive charge with a triple bond uh, to nitrogen. And what happens is that methyl carbanion um, gets protonated, so it deprotonates the carboxylic acid, and we generate a carboxylate plus uh, this species here. Now, uh, this is very unstable, and the carboxylate, and it's a very good electrophile. Um, so the carboxylate can attack the carbon and displace nitrogen, and so in that process, you get nitrogen gas coming off. This is an SN2 type mechanism, um, and you see that we generate a methyl. Um, methyl ester plus nitrogen gas, and that nitrogen gas um, then essentially goes away and it drives that reaction forward. Now one thing about this is that diazomethane is highly explosive, and so this isn't used often, uh, but uh, in very small quantities, if you need methyl esters in very small quantities, um, you can use diazomethane. Now, a next reaction of carboxylic acids is the formation of amides. Um, so here we have a, a carboxylic acid, and if we want to form an amide, uh, it's not very easy to do so. And the reason for this, if we take a look at the structure, we have to remember that carboxylic acids are acids. Uh, and if, if you think about how you would produce an amide, you would react it a carboxylic acid with an amine. Well, amines are bases. And so what happens is that uh, the amine deprotonates the um, carboxylic acid and you form a carboxylate plus the ammonium salt, right? So these are simply ammonium carboxylate salts. All right, if you heat the living daylights out of the ammonium salts, sometimes you can essentially dehydrate the ammonium salt and produce an amide. This is a very rare occasion uh, because most of the time they, the salts decompose. Uh, and so this isn't a very good method of, of making amides. However, we can take uh, a carboxylic acid with an amine in the presence of DCC and very easily produce amides in high yields. DCC, the structure of it looks like this, right? And it stands for dicyclohexyl carbodiimide. Dicyclohexyl carbodiimide, uh, DCC. And DCC, what happens is it reacts with the carboxylic acid. It is a base and the carboxylic acid is an acid, and so we're going to get uh, um, proton transfer to the DCC from the carboxylic acid, and we generate our protonated DCC and our carboxylate. Uh, 
So now at this stage, the carboxylate can attack DCC, and it attacks the carbon of DCC, displacing a carbon-nitrogen bond. We then generate this particular species right here, right? So you see that the carboxylate is attached to the carbon. That carbon now has a double bond to one of the nitrogens with the cyclohexyl ring and a single bond to one of the nitrogens uh, with the, the cyclohexyl ring. And this group right here is a very good leaving group, right, containing the, the oxygen. So what we've done is we basically have converted the, the carboxylic acid into an ester-like derivative that actually has a, um, a very good leaving group coming off of it. And we'll see why it's a good leaving group in just a little bit. So now, if I take that um, complex and I react it with an amine, the amine can then attack the carbonyl carbon. And I generate my, uh, so now my, my carbon, uh, or excuse me, my oxygen has a negative charge. The um, the amine is now an ammonium uh, ion. And of course, I can deprotonate the ammonium ion. And now I have this big species right here, right? So the only thing that I did is I deprotonated the, uh, the ammonium ion. So now I have uh, a neutral nitrogen. I still have the negative charge on the oxygen. And remember, this whole group here from the DCC is a good leaving group. So now what happens is that oxygen is going to reform, and we can think of this as a tetrahedral intermediate, right? That carbon is a tetrahedral, it's sp3 hybridized, uh, but it has an oxygen uh, with a negative charge. And that oxygen uh, is going to want to donate a pair of electrons to the carbon, especially with the good leaving group. And so we reform the carbonyl carbon, in the process, creating an amide, and we generate our leaving group coming off of it. And of course, that leaving group is a very stable ion because uh, through it's stabilized through resonance, of course, right? Resonance is always the key, typically, uh, for stabilization. And so we see that I can donate a pair of electrons uh, from that oxygen to create an oxygen-carbon double bond, displacing a carbon-nitrogen double bond. And so I delocalize that negative charge between the oxygen and the nitrogen on there. Now, the key is that I can make amides. So I can take a carboxylic acid, treat it with an amine in the presence of DCC, and I can generate amides. So you see that I can uh, I can make esters from carboxylic acids. I can make amides from carboxylic acids. All right. <clears throat> I can also make acid chlorides from carboxylic acids. And we've seen this reaction before uh, when we talked about the Friedel-Crafts um, acylation, where, it, where you can generate acid chlorides um, from uh, carboxylic acids, treating them with uh, thionyl chloride. So if I take a carboxylic acid, treat it with thionyl chloride, I get acid chlorides. Now, I also get um, hydrochloric acid, and I get sulfur dioxide gas. So let's take a look at the mechanism of this reaction. The first step is obviously reacting the carboxylic acid with thionyl chloride. And the structure of thionyl chloride looks like this. So sulfur has a double bond to oxygen. It has a pair of electrons on the sulfur. And it has two sulfur chlorine single bonds, uh, sigma bonds, right? Now, uh, the mechanism is uh, a little bit different here. The carbonyl oxygen, as we've seen in the past, is the better base. And so it attacks that sulfur. It's going to be stabilized through resonance, and we're going to show that resonance stabilization uh, from a pair of electrons on the OH group. So when that carbonyl oxygen attacks the sulfur, we displace the sulfur-oxygen bond. And this is what we generate, right? So notice the, the um, OH now, and I just moved it to the top there, the OH has a, a double bond to the carbon. The carbonyl oxygen originally now has a, a, essentially a single bond um, because I basically moved those electrons up. And now that oxygen is connected to the sulfur and the sulfur has um, 
the oxygen of the sulfur has a negative charge associated with it. So the next step is uh, a reformation of an the oxygen sulfur double bond and displacing a chloride ion. And so you get this intermediate right here. And now that chloride can come along and deprotonate the um, carbonyl oxygen, and we generate this species right here. Now, it's a neutral species, but it's very unstable. And so what happens next is, you know, we can think of, well, we'll we can think about what happens next is uh, proton transfer again to the carbonyl oxygen. Uh, and you might say, well, why can't I just, you know, I'm generating the same species um, as the, the one on the upper left hand corner there. And we certainly are. I'm just showing you that that, that neutral species um, can be produced but is unstable in acidic conditions. Um, so if I had a, a stronger base in this reaction, I can actually isolate this. But in acidic conditions, what happens is the chloride, instead of uh, deprotonating that hydrogen there, it can actually attack the carbonyl, and we generate this tetrahedral intermediate. And so now that tetrahedral intermediate um, collapses to reform a protonated carbonyl, uh, and then we kick off, and notice what happens when we kick off. We kick off um, the chloride from the sulfur, and we generate sulfur dioxide gas plus chloride ion. So now we have a protonated acid chloride plus a chloride ion plus SO2. And now that chloride ion can be used to deprotonate the, um, the carbonyl group, and we generate our acid chloride plus HCl plus sulfur dioxide.